Thank you for joining Our Discovery. Um, as you know, this channel has been featuring performances of uh, shows at Solaire, for example, or uh, shows of my friends and talents also. Um, but I thought of changing it a bit. Since it's called Our Discovery, why not highlight and discover talent and highlight what they're all about? And um, the first guest, perfect. Um, he's not a new discovery, actually. We discovered him when he was, what, 12? Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> 12, 13. 12, 13. But there's so many great things that are happening at, in his life at this point. And it's like starting all over again. It's like discovering again. Yeah. Um, Joaquin Valdez, who is now Joaquin Pedro Valdez in the U.S. So, wow. UK. Uh, UK. UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's prophetic. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> so, Wax, I mean, um, you, you, you've done everything. You started, how old were you when you started theater? I, professionally, my very first show, and I, I say professionally, meaning I got a check for singing and dancing <laughs> on stage, yeah. was when I was 11 and I did Evita in Morocco Theater with Repertory Philippines with Menchu as our Evita. Oh, wow. And I was... I was one of the children singing Santa Evita. Uh -huh. Parang kit na kami. We just we just came out in two scenes. You auditioned for that? Yeah. There was a whole audition and and I I distinctly remember auditioning for rap back then because they had a nice theater in Shangri-La, William J. Shaw Theater. Yeah. And your auditions were on stage with the voice of Tita Biba in the darkness. <laughs> Cutting you off after two lines or more. <laughs> well, what, why, as a kid, would you even um, would you even think about auditioning for theater? Um, you know, growing up, my, my family was always into musicals. Like we had all of Lea Salonga's LPs and uh, tapes mm -hmm. and multiplexes in our karaoke machine. Um, we had the Miss Saigon tapes playing nonstop. We liked watching you and all of the other theater luminaries in Morocco theater. Every time there was a big rep show. Mm -hmm. I remember watching, but not remembering the story, but I remember watching or the experience of watching Les Miserables um, in Morocco Theatre and Carousel. So I wanted to get into that because my family really introduced me to theatre and my first foray into it was joining the summer workshop of rep in Shangri-La in 1994. Wow. And in 1995, there were auditions for Evita and yeah, that's where we auditioned and then we got in. There was a bunch of us children who were, who were in that show. Were you the only one who made it all the way? I mean, since? Do you remember any other people who auditioned? You know what? With me then, I still remember a couple of them, but with me then, um, I remember was Chriselle Kozumi. Okay. Yeah. We were Magkabach in, okay. in Repertory Philippines. Um, we were taught by Lourdes Faberas, who is also now in the UK. Um, and uh, yeah, we joined Evita, we got in, and from then on, Children's Theater, uh, Tita Baby saw me in Evita, said, you'll be my Pinocchio for Children's Theater. I went into Pinocchio, 1996. Then 1997, there was a theater company from across uh, the mall saying <laughs> that they were putting up uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I'm like, I love that story. Yeah. It's a brand new original musical, so I joined Trumpets in Union Church. And, and he true. got the lead role playing Edmund in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which to this day, his voice is preserved in a recording. Yeah. I hope it gets released. We're going to put it out on Spotify <laughs> very soon, yeah. so you're going to be immortalized there. Nice. Um, but the reason why I asked of who of, who of the kids made it, um, and it's because it's about perseverance. And I think if there's any story, if there's anything that drives your story, Wax, is the fact that you, you've got the perseverance. So let's let's jump over. Right. I mean, years. So you you were successful already as a young uh, child actor in the theater, and then I do remember. Mm -hmm. So his voice started to change around about what 14, 15? Yeah, right after right after Lion Witch, my voice changed, but nakasinya pa tayo ng Young King and So David, but I was already cracking. Yeah, I was already cracking for 14, 15, but then when I was around. 16, 17. Yeah, and that's why I decided that, you know, see, Wacky and then another uh, kid, John Ardu, who's a little bit older than him, um, 
ganun din, you know, they were both in the Lion Witch in the wardrobe, mm-hmm. and then naging alanganin yung edad nila. They were already too old to play kids, yeah. and yet too young to play romantic leads or the young, young adults. So, naisipan namin na gumawa na isang boy band, because at that time, the yeah. 90s, so, boy so, bands are in. Yeah, and I swear, if BTS was a thing back then, uh-huh. we would be killing it. We would be doing Absolutely. It. Yeah, that's the stuff. For those of you who've never heard of 1728, you <laughs> need to do research because to me, and not because I was involved in your career, you were the best boy vocal group in the country. I mean, we had Mon Faustino as uh, well, arranging yeah. all of our stuff. Yeah. And he was, the, the you know, he, he still is, but he's the top of, the top of his game. So he was make, he was really our MD and not not just giving us music. He was making sure that we sounded a certain way and up to his standard. So my young like, was really a you know, cut above the rest. And in 1728, by the way, that's also where we discovered Gian Magdalal yeah. and then Chino Alfonso. Alfonso. So really talented uh, vocalist kids. But Waki, even at that age, you really you really marched to the beat of your own drum. You didn't, you didn't <laughs> did. stay long in 1728. And then soon after that, he says, you know what, Tito, I'm gonna, I, I think I'm gonna leave. Which surprised all of us. Yeah. But later on, I would discover this is, this is his personality. This would be consistent. And Wacky moved on because you wanted to, why did you leave? You wanted to do your own music. Yeah, I wanted to, because I was writing some music for the band, but then I wanted, I guess I just wanted to see what I could do more. Like, I, I needed a reason to keep moving forward and moving upward. And as soon as I feel stagnant, or like, like, wala na mapupuntahan, I get, I don't get creative. Like, How old were you at that time? Do you even feel 18. that you got, at 18, you, felt, you were already stagnating? Yeah, I guess, because, I mean, I guess if you, looking back, I realized I was really an artist. Where you need to keep creating and you need to have an opportunity and be in an environment where you're constantly creating. By the way, the, the, the boys hated being referred to as a boy band. Yeah. They hated it. <laughs> so I think that was one reason too. Yeah, yeah. Although I must say, Waki at that age created one of the most beautiful um, OPM songs called Come Breathe Me. I wish you could sing that. We, we released a 2020 version again, remember? Yeah, but yeah. It was, yeah that would be awesome. <laughs> It's, we'll it's have to meant, do a, yeah, it's meant to be sung together with the group. Okay, can, can I go for a 1728 reunion oh, sometime let's, let's in the do future? That for sure. <laughs> Even by Zoom. So soon after that though, then you jump into, you were also taking, the whole time you were doing hip hop, you know, you're taking street yeah. dancing classes yeah. and, and all of that. That's why I you know, to try to kind of do the boy band. But this, yeah. then I lost track of you for a while. Yeah. Next thing I knew, you were in film school mm-hmm. and you won an award. Tell us about that. So I went to film school. I was an architecture major in UP, but then again, I I felt trapped and it wasn't authentic to who I was. And it's like, I'm not gonna become an architect. I just know, I don't know what I'm gonna become, but I'm not gonna become an architect. So if people feel like they don't know what they're taking up and why, it's normal. Keep asking. I didn't know that, I can relate. I was also an archie student. Yeah, four years. I I took four years in UP. Four years? And on my fourth year, I shifted. That's why I graduated UP. I, I, I kid. I graduated UP in seven years. I always say my man. But then I years. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> four years. Yeah, four years of architecture. And then it was in plumbing class I realized I'm not going to become an architect. Plumbing. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, I actually I'm just not. So I went uh, I went to the college across the campus, um, Mascom, uh, and film. And I thought, hey, I'm not sure if I really like film, but I, let's see. And I I went into it, I got accepted into the college, and I realized I really, really loved it. I really loved storytelling, and I really loved visuals, I really loved the design aspect of it, and how to create pictures, and how to create meaning behind certain photography, um, shots in photography, color, performance for the camera, and all of this all its roots back to my experience in kid. All of it. Like, there, I love the theater. I mean, I think that's one of my most joyous experiences in my life um, growing up. So when, when I went to film school, I realized this was just another kind of theater. And all of the years that I invested as a theater actor and as a practitioner in the theater helped me become the filmmaker that I was. And it helped, I think I was doing something right because it, it kind of opened up a lot of doors for me as a film director. I became a film director for nine years in advertising. I remember watching your film, um, your student film, yeah. 
And it was with, yeah, it was with, uh, with Sid, uh, Lucero. Sid Lucero. That was amazing. The visuals were amazing. Wait, I just need to squeeze it in there because a lot of young people watch and they always ask, you know, what kind of, of college education should I pursue? This is a big struggle mm. for them. And sometimes the parents tell them what to do. Yeah. Did you have struggle when you decided to get out of architecture after four Oh yeah, it was a whole like existential thing. I felt like I was doing something wrong. But how about your parents? Were you pressured? Did um, they understand? They were... No, they didn't understand. Uh, and I'll, okay, I'll be completely on. honest, they didn't understand. Until I started finding my identity as a filmmaker. And then they realized, oh my god, mm -hmm. this is what... This is what he's good at. In fact, when I won an award in China, my student film won an award in China, my dad and I took a trip to China. Oh, and, yeah, wow. to take that award. And it, I think it was really nice. It was nice that I got to spend time with him um, in that capacity. And I, we were there because my film was receiving an award. My mom as well realized that I was, you know, headed for this path. Um, yeah, so I, I think later on, the, the risk of leaving and even not knowing if it's worth it, paid off. Because I went to somewhere I felt um, more of my authentic self. Yeah. You got validated right away with the yeah. award. Yeah. All right, now tell me about how you, all of a sudden, uh, again, very young age, did a film. Well, at, at UP, when you graduate, your, your output is a film. And I knew, I knew that I had lost years because I shifted late. And because I shifted late, I made sure that every opportunity I had in film school, there was an output that I could put into my CV or put into my reel, which would eventually be viewed by people who would possibly give me work in the future. How did you do Dagum? Da Dagim. Dagim. Yeah. So Dagim was right after co college, 2000. How did that happen? It was like a, it was a commercial film. Wasn't it, it was Cinema One film. So you, you submit a proposal and a script, and then you get finalized. And so you, that's what you did. Yeah. The so story's your own. The story was my own. The story was my own. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of a... Uh, I don't know Lord of the Flies. Flies. So it pulled from Lord of the Flies, pulled from uh, the Kiefer Sutherland Lost Boys. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it had that, but then I wanted to play around with the aesthetics of um, Pinoy folklore, but without having to be literal in the, in the folklore. Yeah. In that manga, I, swung, I didn't want to be literal, I wanted to be a little bit metaphoric. I, Honestly, looking back, I think it needed a lot of writing work. I, you know, I'm I'm more mature now than I was, but then it was a good opportunity for me to flex my film muscles and learn from that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. I remember watching it in Chan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, that even had a screening in uh, Cambodia. Yeah, it really? had another different screening in Cambodia. It was very interesting, and I it won awards for Mark Abaya. Yes. Um, and won awards for Martin De Rosario, who yeah. was in that film as well. And lots of those guys in my tribe, Nico Manalo, Nico, uh, Gerald Napoles, they're, they're all... Oh, I didn't even yeah, I didn't remember that Gerald was there. Yeah, Rita, Did you audition all these? Yeah, I auditioned it. And I, and I think the boys liked my process because I approached it like, again, like a theater actor. And I only hired mainly theater actors. And those that didn't come from the theater, like Tina Marco Baya, now wanted to do theater mm -hmm. because the process that I, I approached it in was from my discipline as a theater actor. So again, it goes back to me being a theater actor. Right? It's always been there. But you didn't go full steam uh, doing commercial, uh, I mean, uh, like, you know, uh, movies. You Instead, you shifted to commercials, TV commercials. Intention. Because um, the advice to me was that my strength as a filmmaker was really more visual okay. and granted. And I. I knew that I wanted to work with the, the discipline and the technicality that was available in the international scene. And unfortunately, our films here and our TV here is not quite in the practice of how... Masyado formula. Well, not just formula, but the process, like how, how they shoot things here oh. is quite different from, for example, a tele, we have tennis areas. And it still serves its purpose here. But then abroad, all uh, they don't have tennis areas anymore. It's not it's not a TV series the way we do TV series here. It's a TV series, but then everything is scripted and shot as an entire season. Right. So you're not changing scripts as you go along. 
it's all fixed. And you shoot one season, you shoot the pilot, and then you shoot the entire season, and that's fixed. And then if it's successful, then you move on to another, another. So was it more the system that kind of like dis dissuaded you? Um, not so much dissuaded me. I was really open to shooting my own films, but I wanted the discipline mm -hmm. of uh, the international standard. And in, the, in commercials, the pressure is a little higher because there's so much more money involved. And because there's so much more money involved, the standards are so, so high, sometimes even ridiculously high. Mm -hmm. And the competition is also really high. Yeah. And the aesthetic is also really high because now you're working and using internationally um, uh, accredited, like not, not accredited, but international standards of uh, hardware. The cameras we're using, the lights we're using, mm -hmm. the kinds of graphics that we're using. It's really, really high. It's really, really up there. How did you break into that? Oh, that, that literally grit. So now, everything that I had, including my two films, and all of my whatever little reels I had that I accumulated, music videos, short films that I accumulated um, in college, I had it in a little DVD, uh, burnt DVD disc, and I was shopping, knocking on doors, giving it to producers, broadcast producers, giving it to agencies, giving it to production houses, and literally meeting people and asking them, begging them to give me a shot um, at their commercials. So the personality na yan, ever since, Fox. I think, I, I think <laughs> when it comes too easy, when it falls on your lap, I don't like it. Like, I, I want, I, I'm always about merit. I like working for what I feel I deserve. And I would be the first one to, to tell myself that if I don't get something, it's probably because I don't, I'm not ready for it yet. Mm. You know what I mean? So I don't like being given things. I don't, I don't like feeling entitled to certain things. I like working for things. So you established yourself pretty much. I, I do remember the few times you told us, oh, I had this commercial. And we got, yeah. It was very impressive. Yeah. So you were doing very well at one point, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, very well, again, um, this is going to be on YouTube and uh, no holds barred no anthem, but yeah, very well in the sense of, and I look at w what I mean by very well, in, is it because I was more known in the industry? Yeah, check. Is it because um, I was getting more projects? Yeah, check. Is it because I was charging this much as a director? Yeah, check. But then I'm thinking, okay, what's the gauge for me to know if I'm either improving or moving up? And I realized that there is no gain. It's so arbitrary. It's so subjective. Especially when people were shifting now from the usual film, literally celluloid, way of shooting uh, commercials to digital. I was right at the cusp. Mm -hmm. So it was. I was still there in the debate of some directors preferred using film cameras and others started using these cheaper, more affordable digital cameras. And even clients and agencies, they weren't sure. They thought that you only needed to use film cameras for hair commercials or beauty commercials, but you can't use digital cameras. But, so we were, it was this shift. Mm -hmm. And now everyone is, still, is now using digital cameras mm -hmm. for all of their products. So I was there at the cups and I was charging a certain, I was charging a very competitive pr price. But I realized later on that when the digital shift was, was happening, some of these directors who I aspired to reach in terms of rates are now softening their rates and going oh. down to my level. Be so, because the medium is more accessible yeah, for and more they, people. Ex and they wanted to be more competitive. So it, there was no more gauge, there's no benchmark for me to follow anymore because someone who I had looked up to in terms of how much he, he charged and the standard and the aesthetic that he had, um, I was already in the same bids. I was already being considered side by side with these, some, some of these directors, but they were now charging lower. Ah. So rightfully so, because they're, they're more experienced, they'll, they'll, they'll definitely, I'll always lose to them, right? So that kind of begged the question about where is my, where am I headed? Like, if, how can I grow? How can I keep bettering myself? And also, directing commercials, dogs, it, it takes its toll on you. It's quite tiring. 
um, yes, you, you are the director, and there's a load of pressure on you because it's not just we think was I know one shooting day, then that's it, right? Mm -hmm. But then you're attending all the meetings, you have to defend it, and and um, it's a lot of a lot of money and a lot of investment on your shoulders. It's quite tiring. It burnt me out, and once in a while, just so that I gain my soul back, I'll do some theater. So it became work. It became, became work. It, it became, became work. work. It became work, and it has to be work. Yeah, yeah. It has yeah. to be work. I was, I was, you know, I was renting out a condo. I, I just got married. It was work. And then when I realized that, hey, where am I going? Why can't I? It wasn't even about the money. It was more about why, if I can no longer see myself improving or or what's it, getting promoted in whatever sense of the word that means, I don't see a future anymore. Like I thought I could see myself directing for the rest of my life, but then, but then at least in that scenario, I'm like, can't be doing commercials for the rest of my life because there's absolutely no fulfillment artistically. And now financially, it's also not that great. So it burnt me out. It became work. It became toxic. Um, and then, and to escape that toxicity, I would go back to the theater once in a while. And I was in the lucky position that I could pretty much go back to the theater and say, "Hey, I'm ready." And then people would say, "Join this. Do this. Join yeah. this." Right. I was lucky enough to be in that position. So how your age, you were, you're starting to be, I mean, you were already of age to become a leading man. Right, right, right. No. By the way, we, uh, I did this role which he ended up doing. I knew it was full circle. <laughs> and that I was old already when he took on Jamie of, of the last five years. Right, I, I right. was amazing to hear you. Yeah, that was a love, I mean, I love that show. And I yeah. think, I think it was because of that show that I kind of started to question that. But um, what am I doing? I, this is what I, Oh, oh yeah. It right. never actually it never left. It never left. It really never left. And I was in my mind, I was telling this lie to myself, now okay, give yourself, you know. But also, it's hard to build a career full time as a theater actor, and you know that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I work in a casino. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> right? And that's why the best of the best in Philippine theater can't have theater as their full-time job. They have a main job, which is either teleseries or TV or whatever, you know, racket. Yeah. And then they do theater because they love it. And that's what was happening to me. I was looking for an excuse to, cause, and, and commercial in the street thoughts is out of sight, out of mind. So once you're gone for too long, <laughs> oh, oh, so it was always a big deal for me to lose out a month and meaning I'll tell my production house I'm not gonna take any projects for a month and they and the production house basically tells you and puts you forward for bids and it took for me to tell them I, I can't take any work for one month or two one month for rehearsals and another for yeah, for the role for, for uh, the show. yeah for the run. run because you need to commit to that time you need to commit to that rehearsal and I didn't want a short change even if I was earning nothing from the show I didn't want to shortchange my co-actors and I didn't want to shortchange my company just because, you know, I wanted, I needed to sneak in that act. So, yeah, so um, I would take some leaves off once every two, three years to go back to the theater until it came to the point, I said, I don't want to keep, I don't, I don't want to keep um, putting theater as a, as a means for my, for me to kind of take a holiday from my work. I want theater to be my work. But knowing that there was not enough money in it. Right. Knowing that there was not enough money in it, me and my wife were like, okay, if we, it was very logical. It's a very one is to one equation. Okay. If I want to be a full-time theater maker, if I want to be a full-time actor, where would I go? Because obviously in the Philippines, it's not going to be the case. And there were two options, Broadway or the UK, right? And scary, because that would mean, <clears throat> that would mean that I would have to retrain, probably start from zero, maybe because I don't have the training that other practitioners in musical theater and drama abroad train two, three years before they land their first professional gig. So 
it's going to be basically a, a small finish, a small fish in a big ocean. Um, but it was a risk that we were that we felt was worth taking. And then what auditions for Miss Saigon came? Audition 2016. I won't forget this. 2016, <clears throat> there was an audition for Miss Saigon. I was still in. Um, oh, actually, back that time, 2014, the very first time they came back to Manila for the revival. Heard Miss Saigon, and I, I said, no, I'm done with it. I'm not. I'm a full-time director. And I'm not going to do that. Lie, lying to myself. And at that time. Um, like no, it's not, it's not gonna happen. No, I'm not gonna do it. So I did it. I did audition. And then 2000, 2016, there they came back for the for the auditions for the UK tour. Mm. And Casabayan ko dyan si Red, who okay. eventually became the engineer. Yeah. Gerald Santos, who became Tui. Mm. Um, yeah. And many, uh, Jorin Bautista, who eventually became Kim. Everybody who was anybody who was there in that audition. And I lined up. But I was still directing commercials. Hmm. And I thought, if I get in Miss Saigon, that would be my signal from the universe that that's it. That's my ticket up. Right? That's my signal now. Okay, drop, drop whatever you're doing. Right? And then go. But I was looking for that excuse. Mm. I was I was too scared and cowardice to take the risk on my own. So 2016, I was still directing full time, full time directing, and I I played hooky. I auditioned for Miss Saigon. I didn't tell my production company. I didn't tell anyone in advertising I was still doing it because I thought if I get in, and I felt I had humor. nobody knew you audition. Yeah, <laughs> nobody knew exactly. I never knew. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I remember, I remember Carlo Rosa. He usually tells me when he does these things. Nobody knew. I remember Carlo Rosa seeing me in the line of like eight hundred people. Oh, Maki, look at that And and uh, I was like very quiet about it. But then also because I was so scared, um, I felt I had a chance. But I want. I was scared not that I was not going to get into the show, but I was scared of saying goodbye to the comfort I had as a director for mm -hmm. commercials. Mm -hmm. So 2016 happened, Makasunud pa kami Gerald Santos. Our numbers were Makasunud. And I got called back, we both, we all got called back. I made it to the final, but then I got cut. So I didn't get, I didn't get, I didn't book Miss Saigon. And that was my up and down. It's like, I got depressed and I, I got depressed and I assessed why was I feeling bad. And I was feeling bad, not because you know, I didn't get in this room, but because I wanted so much for a reason, an out from my, from getting burnt out as a director. And then, that's when I sat down with my wife. And we processed all of these emotions. Then I realized that the reason I was so affected was because I was completely unhappy with my work. And I go, I didn't need a Miss Saigon to decide on this. It was scary because now everything's unsure. But I knew where I wanted to go. It was the how that we didn't know. Uh, yeah, it was how we were gonna get there that we didn't know. So the decision was leave film because you weren't happy. Leave commercial, commercial directing. Commercial yeah. directing. And to pursue an acting career abroad, not yeah. even here. No, that was, a, that was a very clear decision. How we were gonna do that, we didn't know. Ang tatamua. Scary. It was scary. But then I think that was the faith that God wanted to hear. That was the courage that I needed to have. It wasn't... If I got in Miss Saigon in 2016, it would have been like, a, like, oh yeah, I'm saying goodbye to this because I have another opportunity. It was safe. You know what I mean? Mm. It was safe. But then I didn't. And I still had that resolve to be a theater actor. Despite the rejection, and despite not knowing how, so I decided. Me and my wife decided that okay, I'm gonna train. So I applied into drama schools, and I got in a drama school in the UK. And we were preparing now. We had two years from 2007, 16 to 2018. We were gonna prepare to raise the funds for us to study. Into, uh, uh, in the UK. For those who don't know, Waki's wife is a lawyer. She's a lawyer. Yeah. Right. 
and she had a career here as well, but then she was completely supportive of, uh, of me. She said, let's do it. You don't know how, but let's do it. We'll literally beg and borrow and work our ass off to get to the goal that we wanted. So we were both singular, we were both united in the goal. And we had a school. A school had offered me a place already for 2018, and that was already another affirmation. Right. Uh, just a quick break. How did you audition for that school? Did you have to send an audition? Oh, yeah. So, no. So, for, for auditioning in drama school, if you're here, um, just be diligent in, in looking at the website mm -hmm. of all of these drama schools that you want. Narrow down your choices because Malulula has an option. So, there's so much options. And every time you apply, there's a fee. It's quite expensive. Wow. So, um, yeah. So, I narrowed down my options. I did my research. And one of them had offered me a um, in 2018. But it wasn't a scholarship, you have to pay your way. No, I, I was going to pay. Wow. Yeah, I had to pay my way. Wow. Um, but then, yeah, so, but then they do a Skype interview. What happened on Zoom then? It was uh -huh. all Skype. So, Skype interview, and um, they assess you, and they look at your resume. And it was also for the first time when I was being interviewed by the panel that they looked at my resume and everything I had done, theater and film they accept it, like they, they appreciate it. But they looked at it and they were like, wow, you've done so much work in oh, really? both theater yeah. and film. Yeah, yeah. So, and they, it, it worked. Dito kasi pa, they like being boxed, we like being... Well, what kind of a course was this, by the way? So I was for, I was gonna go into an acting course for two of the applications that I had done. And the other one was a theater directing course. Hmm. And that's the one I got accepted into. Um, and they were they were so lovely. Um, it was it's from a notable school as well. And yeah, so I mean, when we just go. We're like, okay, that's good. We we have a, we have a goal. This is it. <laughs> and it's such a release that we didn't need a Miss Saigon to know what we wanted to do. Good, good. And it was it was it was such a release. So 2017 was basically me saying goodbye to advertising. Um, I said goodbye. I love my production house that I was working in. I, explain to them and I said 2017 was is me about it's about me regaining my craft so I said yes to odds to everything acting so that here here so that by the time I leave if I leave by the time I leave on my CV I'll have more mm. and current titles so I said yes to, to everything I did three musicals that year I did Two straight plays, like I no, I did one straight play, and yes, and I did a tennis area, just so that I have it as well. I did one with uh, ADS-CBN, so I did everything as an actor. Okay, so I, I I pumped up my CV, and at the end of 2017, still knowing that I'm going to school, um, at the end of 2017, uh, I got a call from Cameron McIntosh office saying, "We'd like to invite you for." The extension of the UK of Miss Wow. You just had to make that decision you first. Just, you just had to make that decision first. Bonus that all. Yeah. And I told my wife, it was the icing. I remember I told my wife, uh, should I say yes to Miss Saigon or should I go to school? And yeah. she was like, well, you were going to go to school to have a job like Miss Saigon, yeah. so might as well. This is it. This is this is God. This is the universe telling you, look. Yeah, yeah. You wow. made the right decision. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's 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 the that's the story. All right. So <laughs> now we'll. So okay. One lesson here um, that I, I heard you talk about it in Butch and Manis's house that I want to leave this section hanging is that you said that a lot of people who go into Saigon and that's a great blessing. It's it's a launched a lot of careers. Changed my life. Yeah. yeah. But you didn't want to go in just for that. You saw yourself beyond Saigon. I mean, you didn't even consider Saigon at one yeah, time already. Yeah, I had, right? I had said goodbye to Saigon right. when it came. When it came. So, yeah. So, is it safe to say that, that at least for you, yeah. that you dream beyond Saigon? Yeah, I think... It, it, it wasn't the be-all. I mean, it Right, was, it was an opportunity for me to learn. So, when so a lot of people make Saigon and then that's it. You know, yeah. it's like, wow, I have it. You know, yeah. that's the star on my door. Right. And I, I can retire now and come back here and, you know, and, and 
But that was not enough for you. No, and I, I think... I think it was because of my resolve to be a theater actor, period. Mm. That I saw a possibility of life after Saigon. I knew that what, whatever it took, and I, I, I told my wife this, I don't mind scrubbing the floors of a bathroom inside a theater in London for as long as I'm in a theater. You know, and that's the, that, that was my resolve. Like, I, I knew I wanted to be a, a theater maker. I knew I wanted to be working in a theater, inside the theater world, in, in the industry. And Saigon was basically my school. Yeah. It, was, it was a baptism of fire. It was like, welcome to this standard. Welcome to the global standard. Welcome to, this is your school. So I was just learning as much as I could. And I, and I took that opportunity, every single opportunity, to pick out, unlearn a bad habit, see what they did in, in the international stage, take that, get better, get lessons, you know, and just keep improving, knowing that I needed to be ready for more after the contract. And he'll tell us what happened after the contract ended. <laughs> we'll leave you there for now. Safe behind these windows and these parapets of stone Gazing at the people down below me All my life I wonder as I hide up here alone Hungry for the histories they show me All my life I memorize their faces Knowing them as they would never know me all my life I wonder how it feels to pass the day Not above them, but part of them And out there living in the sun Give me one day out there All I ask is one to hold forever out there where they all live unaware what I'd give what I dare just to live one day out there There amongst the millers and the weavers and their wives Through the roofs and gables I can see them Every day they shout and scold and go about their lives Heedless of the gifts it is to be them If I was in their skin i treasure Every instant out there Strolling by the sand Taste a morning out there all I ask is when to freely walk about there just one day and then I swear I'll be content with my share won't resent won't despair old and bent I won't care I'll have spent one day out there